Earlier this year, I picked up this amazing lot of really obscure Sega hardware with some games, and if you've seen that video, you know things weren't 100%. So how much of this can I get working? Let's find out. So yeah, we had issues with both of these systems. The SE3000H, while showing signs of life, wouldn't output any signal, and the SF7000, which does display video as I tested it with my other working SE3000s, would not read any discs, let alone spin them up. I feel like the SE3000H will be a much easier fix, so let's start with that. Oh, fair warning, I didn't record a whole lot of things, so I apologise in advance if things seem a little bit disjointed. First, let me introduce my past self to show you how to open up one of these systems. So this is an interesting system to get into, you'll see why in just a bit, but for now we have three screws along the bottom edge. You know what a screwdriver is and how to use one, hopefully. My middle one is missing though, and I have no idea if that void warranty sticker is factory or not. Keep in mind that these screws hold the keyboard down, so be careful from here about how you move it. Once the screws are removed, we move to the joystick side of the system, and this is where you have to start being careful, and I'm sorry if it's not clear to see, but you have to pry these two bits of plastic apart to release a tab, and doing it successfully should result with an obvious pop sound. Move to the other side now, where there's yet another tab, but at a different angle, so it's pretty much the same thing, really. Again, be careful with the loose keyboard, but now, once the system's the right way up again, you should be able to lift that top piece with minimal difficulty. I had to do some fidgeting, but in the end, it came free. Thank you, past me. Now, when you lift back the keyboard section, you have to be careful with these two ribbon cables, as old ones could go bad and break easily, so we're not taking any risks with that. Then there are two other wires soldered to the board you need to be aware of as well. Uh, yeah, because otherwise, this happens. Doesn't take long for me to diagnose her as a bit dusty, so I break out the toothbrush to get that crap out. I'm also noticing that the cartridge connector pins are an odd colour. Interestingly, it looks like the connector itself is glued into place as though it's had a connection issue in the past like my other SE3000. Probably a common issue. Now in case you think you can just unscrew and lift the whole board out, here's my past self once again with an important announcement. Now, this is an interesting thing. For reasons only known to Sega, they decided to solder the power switch through the system's case. So if you need to get underneath the board like I do, we needed to solder it and remove it from the case, which thankfully is pretty easy. I just added a bit of solder to the joints to help free up the old solder, then used a solder pump to remove enough of it to free the switch. Then it was just a case of popping the switch out by squeezing the sides in and pushing it outwards. Thanks again past me, now you can take out the screws on the motherboard and lift it out of the case. On the underside, I can already see other signs of previous work being done, as a lot of solder joints look newer than others. But looking around the video and audio output where we actually need to look, there are damaged traces. And testing them with a multimeter confirms that they are not making a connection. A little bit of reflowing fixes most of them, but three connections had to be patched with wire. And yes, I know, it looks horrible, but whatever. Let's test it out. Yep, that's all it was. Bad connections. Okay, who wants to see the insides of an SF7000? I know I do, and I get the satisfaction of actually opening one up. Fantastic. Just like a VCR. The first thing I do is regret breathing, as the dust makes a beeline straight for my lungs. Seriously, this is a really dusty machine right now. Not the dustiest thing I've ever worked on though, so it's no problem really. With some cotton buds and ample amounts of IPA, the difference is night and day. But our main focus is the floppy drive, and to remove that we need to disconnect it from the board, which is as easy as removing these two cables. The way it's connected is pretty much the same as a standard floppy drive, if not just the same. You can even see down here an area where you can solder a second FDD connector, which you can use to connect a more standard 3.5 inch floppy drive if you ever wanted to do that. Just a little tidbit. 
The driver is disconnected but not yet detached. We still need to unscrew four screws underneath, one of which is one of the rubber feet, but once they are out it's just a matter of sliding the drive out. I inspected the mechanism by inserting a disc and just seeing what happens. I mean, it all looks and feels alright, but I'm still going to lubricate any moving parts that'll benefit from it. Before that though, check this out. I expected this to be the case, but now I'm seeing it for certain. There's the belt, and the belt again right next to it, clearly severed. I don't know about you, but I don't want bits of 80s rubber floating around in there, so let's take it apart further. Well that was nerve wracking. I thought to get to as much of the deteriorated belt as I could, I had to take out these screws so I can get you know, into the mechanism. But this screwdriver, uh, all the screws I think, were just a bit soft. So I think this screwdriver was slowly just stripping away at the top. So... With some water displacement Formula 40, patience and a better suited screwdriver, I managed to free them before moving on to the rest of the rather annoying amount of screws and inconveniently placed cables. Now you'll see here that a couple of wires are soldered directly to the board, so we're not pulling too hard, just treating it like the guts of a small creature dying in your hands. Now we can get a proper look, remove the belt which is in tatters and get some cleaning done. With IPA on a cotton bud, once again, I rub against this big spindle, with decent results. This needs to be rid of any belt residue and moisture of any kind to prevent any belt slippage, and once I think I've accomplished that, I do the same thing to the capstan. But at the beginning, I had to use a little flathead to remove the hardened belt residue, which needed a bit more encouragement. Now I just need the new one. But until then, and after I'm sure it's free of bad belt, uh, back it goes. So how do you source a belt for something this uncommon? Well, just look for other old computers that use 3-inch floppy drives, such as the Amstrad CPC6128, which happens to use a very, very close match, if not an identical drive. While we wait for the replacement belt, let's turn our attention back to the SC3000 because after looking underneath the keys, I would not be surprised if it lost a half a kilogram after a good clean. To disassemble the keyboard section, all we really need to do is unscrew this metal plate, which wouldn't be too bad if it didn't have a million screws attached to it, but once they're out, we can remove that and the circuit sheet thing attached to it. Now, the hard part isn't the removal of a key, it's the amount of times you have to do it. At least, it's a simple enough mechanism. Taking a trip to my high-end cleaning facility, the kitchen sink, the many years of gross can be eradicated. At least from the keyboard section. For the keys, I fill the sink with warm to hot soapy water and just chuck the fuckers in there, apart from the spacebar. The spacebar has a metal rod attached to it, so I don't want to submerge it, but then I drop it in anyway, like a fucking loser. Holy shit. It was at this point that I realised I'd forgotten about the red and grey keys, but I'm going to leave what I got to dry overnight and do the other keys off camera in the meantime. And now my hands are all pruney. As if by magic, it is now the next day and it's coming along nicely and I can't wait to use this thing without worrying about catching a disease. But before we get to that, the floppy belts arrived. Jumping straight back into the SF7000 and extracting the disk drive once again, the belt goes on with zero difficulty. I made sure first that my hands were completely dry before handling the belt though. Remember, no moisture. It's a really nice fit and the tension feels just right. Before I put the drive back into the machine, I clean the heads with, once again, IPA and cotton buds, but you have to be really gentle with this part. Don't put too much pressure on. I'm only doing this very, very lightly. Well, back the drive goes again, and it's time to test it. Ah. 
I spy something beginning with S and it's a spinning success. Now I'm really excited and I grab the first disc I can within reach and stick it in. Okay, it's the wrong disc, but at least it read it. Alright, system disc. No? Why not? Oh, yes. <gasps> you good thing. That is more like it. And that's two for two. The SC3000 and SF7000 are now functional once again, but there's still the issue of the I.O. cartridge and its cable. If you remember, I mentioned earlier on that I'd really like to put the original cable back on. Apparently I didn't think to record much of this part, but I managed to disconnect the current cable from the cartridge by disassembling the connector, prying the wires off it, and then desoldering the ground wire from what looks to be a hand-scratched part of the board. As you can see, just further down the track, there is another, more professional-looking ground point. The original cable now goes back in its rightful place, with the ground wire also soldered to the original location. Thankfully, pin 1 on the cable is color-coded, but unthankfully, I'm very slightly red-green colorblind, but I found it eventually. The connector at the other end doesn't look fun to step on, so I'm going to replace it with a new one, and as if by magic, it's already here. Pry the wires off carefully without damaging the connections, thread them firmly onto the new one, ensuring that the orientation is correct, put the first cover on, curl the cable back over it, and finish by slotting the second cover over that. Now, unless I somehow broke everything, that was nice and easy. And of course, the cartridge still works. Awesome. Okay, I've set out to do most of what I had to do with this lot, and so far, I am really happy. I'm debating whether to leave this episode where it is, or if I should make a shell and label for the cartridge as well. That's better. Look at that. Now, credit where credit is definitely due. It's actually a very, very good imitation of the original label, and for that I must thank a very good friend of mine for making it for me, because without them I wouldn't have this, complete with the original typos. And the only sources we had to copy from were low-res images of the original label, so I think we did pretty damn well. It took a few stages, but I think we got there eventually, to a point where we were both satisfied. Okay, now I think I'm done. Yes? I'm done? Okay. Cool. This video's gone on for a bit long now. I think it's time I signed off. I hope you enjoyed this badly paced video, but, um, as always, I'll be back in 16 bits. Did you drop something? Just a little water displacement formula 40. Actually, dude, it's WD-40. That's what I said. No, dude, you said water displacement formula 40. Yes, it's the same as WD-40, but you could have just said WD-40 instead. Everyone in this house knows you're a loser, dude. You don't need to use overly large words to sound more like a loser. The fact of the matter is that nobody cares how much of a loser you are. If anything, calling abbreviated objects by their full name ironically makes you seem even less intelligent and more pompous than usual. But I know you're not smart enough to understand this.